Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Steve Crouch. Steve is a partner at ANS Composites. Steve, welcome to the pod. Thanks, Spencer. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thanks for coming on. So uh, we've known each other a while, but just now kind of catching up for the first time in a year or two. So good to see you, buddy. <laughs> yeah, and, you too. Uh, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, yeah. So I guess um, in our previous take, I'd asked uh, a little bit about what ANS Composites does for the people listening, and you're starting to go into that. So yeah. sure. Yeah, let's carry on. So yeah. Um, so we're an engineering consulting company. So we don't manufacture anything ourselves. We're we support companies doing new product development pretty much across a bunch of different industries using composite materials. So my, my background is in aerospace originally. Um, we work with like bus manufacturers, um, a lot in amusement park rides. Oh, so cool. a lot of like roller coaster design, not like the coaster itself, but like custom vehicles and that kind of stuff. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. And then we're getting into more, um, more into the defense industry. So a lot of unmanned vehicles. Yeah, you'd uh, mentioned we'll like RC boats at one point. Um, yeah, yes, yeah, so we've done some, um, yeah, some, you know, remote uh, piloted boats um, for um, targeting systems and uh, also, you know, done some other things for like military training. So basically just designed to get shot at for the Canadian Pretty military. Pretty much, yeah. What you're telling me. Yeah, yeah, driving around and then they, you know just there to get blown up pretty much like tracked and blown that's up that's gotta be so. an expensive target i mean like because composites aren't oh, yeah. cheap in general well and then also even like all electronics and stuff too right because that's like you know if you're building these speed boats to kind of drive around just to explode basically that's uh <laughs> yeah it's pretty, pretty costly yeah. but yeah no so we're it's um yeah we're kind of you know involved in a lot of different different stuff right now obviously looking at new markets we're talking to you know, even like a new um, sporting goods company this morning for a new product they're looking at developing. So oh, that's cool. Kind of, yeah, all across pretty much everything. Badass. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of different industries. Um, yeah. Just, I guess for people listening, um, I guess not everyone knows what a composite is. Maybe it's sure. good to go back to first principles. So. Yeah, yeah, you bet. So pretty much um, if anything that's, you know, made of like carbon fiber, fiberglass, um, Kevlar, um, you know, in general, it's, a comp is just a combination of two different materials, but most right. of the ones we do is um, things like, you know, carbon fiber reinforced or anything like, you know, um, that you consider like a graphite hockey sticks or or whatever. That's all kind of included in there. But if, all the way from that all up to um, like uh, aircraft structures and and that kind of cool. thing. So yeah, and we've kind of we do anything from like concepts, you know, initially all the way through like design. Um, figure out manufacturing process, getting people set up for manufacture. So kind of pretty much anything through the whole like value chain we're kind of That's interesting. Deal with. So yeah. just to get like a little more technical then to go the other side. Um, yeah, yeah. In terms of manufacturing, like what's, what are some of the differences between like what goes into making like a carbon fiber aircraft hull versus yeah. what goes into making like, I know you said graphite hockey stick, but I feel like they make them in carbon fiber too. The, oh yeah, like it's, it's the same like, thing. It's like different terms for the same deal. Yeah. yeah. What, what's what's the difference between those two types of layups? Like, I'm sure there are differences just for cost purposes. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it's like part of it's like the material cost. Um, so, when you get into things like aircraft structures, there's like needs higher temp requirements. So then, like the resin system has to be like a better resin system. Um, resin system also, being the goo that holds the the carbon. Exactly. Together. Yeah. Yeah. So when you like, so you pretty much take your know, material lay it up because it's really pliable at first has a bunch of layers and then um, put it through like a heat curing cycle normally and then that'll that'll solidify it and kind of holds it in place and then for more things like the aircraft structures too it's just a lot of uh you there's a lot more you know severity if something goes wrong right so yeah for sure i mean your hockey stick you, breaking versus someone yeah dying. i mean it's it sucks your hockey stick breaks so things are expensive but it's you know, <laughs> a little different if like a you know a plane goes down or something like that so yeah, there's like just, you know, different levels of quality that's needed in those. And, and that kind of makes you go into like some, you know, more costly processes. So the whole thing kind of gets a little more complicated as it gets up to there. So the resin's different. Um, it sounds like the mesh is almost kind of similar, but then the QC is, is vastly different. Yeah. And even just like there's like the materials, um, when you get into anything that's an aircraft, it's all the materials have to be like certified. So there's traceability of batches between everything. And you know, so a lot of that ends up, ends up kind of like adding to the cost of the raw materials. Too. That's a good point. I've been working with that in the space industry recently. So yeah, yeah, it's kind of a whole different, uh, you know, there's a big premium you pay for that. So the materials that 
you know, in, in concept are basically the same thing. Um, just like some minor differences in, in like chemistry, but then there's, um, yeah, th then there's a whole other, you know, quality control, um, side of things that goes into the whole process and that's sort of adds layers to the cost of everything. That makes sense. I mean, I've seen like hobbyists and starves buying, I know this is a different thing, but silicone from, you know, say, uh, whatever that hobbyist provider is that everyone seems to like and yeah. smooth on, you know, versus like a BJB enterprises where it's twice as much money, but you get a data sheet. And I'm sure yep. that that's considered, you know, low grade for some markets where they want, you know, much more traceability than even that gives them. So. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. So how do you go down this road? Like how, how do you get into this? <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of, um, it's kind of funny, like out of, so after I left school, I actually went for a company that was working out of a, um, um, a nuclear power facility that was being decommissioned. And so these, they actually just bought like a electron beam accelerator, um, and we're trying to find uses for it. Oh, cool. And, uh, one of them was actually for like curing resins for composite materials. Wait, so, with the, you need electron beam accelerator? I don't even know what that is. First of all. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's okay. So it's, um. It's pretty much a, a big unit which just um, takes, it, um, fires off a bunch of like really high energy electrons. Interesting. Um, yeah, and it doesn't like. Is a this like a cyclotron thing. where there's like a giant circle that it does it around? Or is no, this... It, this is like smaller. So this is maybe yeah. like, I'm trying to remember the size of the room, but let's just call it something like, you know, thirty feet by thirty feet or something like that. That's still so, a decent sized machine if it takes. A oh machine. yeah, for sure. And then I mean, because you're like firing off a bunch of high energy particles you got to have like uh you know like really thick concrete walls and stuff between everything and um so we were using that one of the things we we're using that for was trying to cure resin system because there's certain formulas you can actually just hit it with high energy interesting um, like that and then so i actually got a uh, got hired um out of school from them to help them with a project they were doing uh, working jointly with boeing to kind of come up with like a new it was more like a new way to make like a a composite tool for making other composite materials. So not really as much parts, but it's like, so yeah, that's how I got kind of roped in the composite side of things. So I worked with them. They were owned by, um, an aircraft repair company. Um, as well, that was their parent company. So I ended up actually getting transferred to the aircraft repair company after a couple of years. So the idea with the repair was that you could drip the, the resin on and, and maybe lay up a little bit over it and then cure it really quickly with that was, a, that was actually the original idea of how that company started. Yeah. They were, that thought was like, um, there was a certain aircraft, I'm not going to say like what it was, um, but that was having a lot of issues with like, uh, repairs, um, like high volume repairs in certain components. So their thought was, well, we can lay them all up at the same time, fire it, you know, just put it through the accelerator, cure them all at the same time. It'll be a lot quicker. Uh, so that was how that started. But then actually by the time I ended up going to the repair side of stuff, they were just doing normal repairs. So nothing, <laughs> just anything more like pre and stuff like that. So I got into doing like you know comms repair for a few years there nice yeah it's crazy yeah initially when you said um you know using that kind of machine to do um you know curing of, of resin it just seems like a tremendously expensive way to get glue to go but then um, right yeah when you mentioned the market i'm like oh yeah, that makes sense <laughs> yeah i mean one of actually one Probably of the a cheap way to do that <laughs> one of the markets for them too is actually um looking at space applications oh cool one of their one of their deals like the thing with if you're curing with a electron beam instead of heat is um because you're effectively curing it at room temperature right so then when you put it into like cryogenic um kind of situations like um you went to space applications then the difference between the temperature that the material was set at and its operating temperature is a lot lower compared to if you're curing with heat yeah. So then you get like less issues with, you know, curve both into thermal expansion and that kind of stuff. That's interesting. So, yeah. I mean, I, I would assume there's heat involved in, in like hitting it with electrons, but just, yeah, for it does actually, end up, it does end up generating heat internally as well. So you, there's kind of like a trade off of like how much energy you have to hit it with and how much heat it generates. And so you can kind of say that it cures it at room temperature, but it kind of doesn't because it generates heat internally. That makes and sense. That's part of you know, kind of needed for the process, but that's interesting, yeah. but still less than you would if you put it in an oven, it sounds like, or yeah, you're not time. putting it up to like, you know, 350, 400 F or something like that. It's, yeah. it's still, you know, quite a bit lower than that. So there's like a bit of a benefit still. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And then, and then from there went to a, um, um, nonprofit, uh, consulting company. 
Cool. So we were actually like funded by the Canadian government and um, and our provincial government to help like manufacturers across Western Canada. Nice. So that's how we got exposed to, you know, all kinds of industries. So then we work with like Boeing, bus companies, um, pretty much everybody uh, who was dealing with, you know, composite materials in Western Canada. So I was there for like 15 years. Oh, cool. Yeah. And that's how we kind of got exposed to one of the nice things about being like working for an offer profit like that too is um, because you're not competing with anybody, you know, you're just there to help them out. Like you get access to, you know, everything really. That's awesome. kind of nice. So that's where um, myself and actually the partner I started uh, ANS with, um, that's where we got the, our experience with a bunch of different industries and things you normally wouldn't get that kind of like wide range of exposure to if you worked for, you know, a single company for, you know, like 10 or 20 years that was just dealing with your own product. Yeah, no, I actually really miss that. I, uh, I did some work consulting for a not-for-profit um, where they were helping out startups in the Pittsburgh area, um, oh, yeah. in Pennsylvania in general. And um, yeah, you got exposed to so many different ideas. I mean, we'll just put, you know, three new things in front of you every day. And so, yeah, it was, and they'd tell you everything. So it was just a great way to, to learn a whole lot of information at once. Oh, for sure. Cycle through hundreds of startups. So it's fun. Yeah, yeah, you get to see what, what works for everybody and what doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, for it's sure. Good way to kind of like, yeah. Why well, do you find you start to get cynical a little bit? Like I've seen this a dozen different times before. Like when someone starts to tell you their idea now, because right. I do. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I mean, there's sometimes uh, you know, sometimes I've got something like legit, and then there's other some interesting ideas that sometimes people come up with, and it's uh, you know, at least a little bit. Um, I'd say like more cautious going into it. Yeah, you know, yeah, some, for sure. Some ideas because like you just kind of see. Once you've seen, you know, what hasn't worked out for, for other people, if you, it kind of gives you like a bit of a radar for that kind of stuff sometimes. For sure. And sometimes you've seen it, you know, from like six different angles, but you can sort of correlate. Yeah. And like, oh, yeah, I saw this, you know, 10 years ago. <laughs> Slightly different configuration. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, that's interesting. So I guess just to change the topic, um, unless you, you're like coming close to something. We can always circle back to it. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah. So what are some of your favorite industries that you've worked on? Like for me, yeah, it's so, biomedical, I think, is, is by mine. Oh, yeah. Nice. Yeah, um, yeah for me, probably, um, I think the, the museum park industry was pretty cool. Like that was, um, that was a good one just because there's a lot of, it's all just like different custom designs for everything pretty much. That's awesome. Um, yeah. And that's kind of, that's sort of like why, you know, it's a kind of a good fit for a lot of composite stuff too, because you can make pretty complex shapes. Because like all the new rides, they are, they're all themed in like, you know, different, uh, you know, so it'll be things like Nintendo World and stuff like that, right? So everything's gonna be like based off of like a Nintendo video game. They have to design custom cars around, you know, each of those like, you know, games and styles and stuff. So, so that was pretty cool. Um, oh, that's really cool. That. Yeah. What are some of the things you made for that project? I guess I, the entire one that. Yeah, so we did, um. Previously, we'd worked for, and unfortunately, like all these rides are mostly in areas like Dubai and other countries that we've never actually gone to be able to test them out ourselves. Ah, brutal. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we were doing um, did quite a bit of work before doing a um, a ride for um, uh, sort of in for a Mario Kart ride, in of like Nintendo World. I think this oh, one might cool. have been. In, I think this one was in Japan, possibly, but not completely sure. I know they're opening up like multiple ones in a couple areas or. Or at least they were planning to like a couple of years ago when since you know since covid and the amusement park industry kind of like crapped out for a while it's hard to say what's going on there these days yeah it makes sense yeah i mean i feel like that's coming back right at least oh, in the sure, u.s yeah. i don't know what it's like in canada but it seems like people have kind of let their guard down wrong. it's like i think people are still getting covid <laughs> i hate to say oh it, yeah but, yeah you know it's, but it's you know for sure at a certain point down. you have to open the economy back up i think is what it came yeah. down to yeah, and, and we've even just been talking to some of the companies we used to work with. Like they're they're seeing like new projects come in, they're bidding on and stuff. So, we're, we, you know, we think it's a like good opportunity there still. That's really cool. Yeah, that's got to be fun. I've never been like as into going to amusement parks, but like recently as an adult from the engineering, per- I'm such a nerd. Like yeah. I look at how these rides are engineered, and I'm like, ah, oh, that's really interesting. Like, you know, that's this is compelling. So. Yeah, there was one that um that we worked on more as like a not doing like the full design but kind of like consulting on it and it was with um 
uh, it was one of the rides where it's like a chair strapped to a robotic arm and then a robotic <laughs> arms on a track. Those things terrify me. Oh, wait, on a track. Yeah, that's yeah, so interesting. So, so okay. it just doesn't move on its own. So the chair is getting flipped around on the robotic arm. The robotic arm is like moving around a track too. So there's all kinds of. That's really you know, interesting. Just, yeah, because I've seen should... the I've seen the chair on the robotic arm, but like on a stationary robot, I've never seen that. on, yeah. on a moving platform. Yeah, those are those are interesting, um, and that's like where it made sense to try and look at things like carbon fiber and stuff because they have to make it they have to make the chair super light, right? Because if you don't, then a robotic arm can't carry it. Um, and then if the robotic arm can't carry, you need like a bigger robot. If you need a bigger robot, you need a bigger track, and then your drivetrain goes up and like <laughs> so everything just kind of scales like really quick if you can't hit and i'm sure the track is is quite a bit of I mean, it's all money but i mean oh you know, yeah yeah for sure yeah. from the scale of the ride i'm sure the track adds up the most of all that yeah yeah so that was kind of interesting that's kind of where like sometimes you know it makes a lot of sense for people to in those industries to try and cut weight as much as they can and then that's where more we're more likely to get involved in you know if they really want to heavily engineer or something right? how much did like, the uh did the chair end up weighing on that example Oh, um, you know, I don't remember offhand. No worries. Yeah, yeah. Like 50 kilograms? <laughs> it was, um, it was like a chair that would hold like four people. And oh, okay, like, so more than that. Yeah, it was pretty big and then it had a bunch of like, you know, safety things strapped to it and they were getting thrown around on this thing. So it, it was like pretty beefy in the end. Yeah, it makes sense. I, yeah. I would think there's no way to make something like that, like super duper small. Yeah, I just, then... even for like, you know, safety reasons and stuff like that, it's kind of, because yeah if there's a chance people get in you know if something goes wrong that's like people go flying off the ride so there's a or get smashed into the, the ride itself something. i mean there's so many things that go wrong with a robotic arm that's why that yeah that that's always been a little bit scary to me but also looks like fun like you see those videos of like someone getting picked up in a chair like a single chair and then like a robot arm like flips them around and does all oh, this yeah, crap yeah. and then puts them back down and you know i'm just like that could smush them against the ground if it wasn't programmed correctly but I'm sure, sure yeah. it's had like a bunch of PEs over it, you know, to ensure safety and yeah. You know, I mean, there's probably a million different ways to make sure that doesn't go wrong, like you said. Yeah, yeah but you still got to really trust the software to and programming to get into one of those things. Yeah, which is um, a challenging thing to do. I, I was in a um, certain manufacturing facility recently, uh, which I'm not going to say which one, but yeah, they had um, full size Fanuc robots, like the like the big yellow boys operating around people as cobots, but they were using um, 2D LiDAR area scanners uh, to, to sort of make them safe. So the idea okay. was that when a person got close to the robot's working envelope, um, they could, um, it would go to a jog first and then it would eventually e-stop out. Yeah. And so that, that was the idea. And I remember I was just kind of, uh, you know, cynical engineer. So I was talking to the plant manager and I'm like, well, what if a person were to sneak around this side and then pop up over here Would that defeat the area sensors? And he goes, if someone did that, we'd fire them immediately. <laughs> like, I don't know if I trust that. Like, yeah. yeah. So I don't know. But um, yeah, I mean, just, just kind of uh, interesting to see. It kind of makes, like for the most part, it's safe. Like, I don't know. Yeah. But, you know, there's always... Once you get like, you know, anything out into the wild, like ro like robots or other, you know, really anything like we design and stuff too, there's people find ways to do weird things to them or, or break them or use them in like unintended ways or approach them in unintended ways. So it's, yeah, Murphy's law. I mean, it's yeah. uh, for sure going to happen. Yeah. And it's, it's so terrible. I mean, I was asked to work on a medical project one time and I think the client, this was with SKA, I think the client wanted, we renegotiated the crap out of that contract, but at one point, um, there was, uh, just the liability didn't make any sense. Like, you know, they were like, well, you know, your insurance should cover this. I'm like, well, hold on a second. Like, this, you're going to be using this to, in a medical context, where is this going to enter the stream of commerce? Yeah. Um, you know, like how many of these are going to be made? Um, like, I'm not sure if I want to even put this on our insurance or accept that level of risk. So it was, it was an interesting renegotiation. Oh, for sure. And in the end, every party was happy, but you know, it was, 
I mean, you really have to think about these things because there's so many things. And then, I mean, obviously, you know, we, we did a high standard of work and, you know, built a system that is still in use and, and people trust and I, I don't think is going to fail. But it doesn't mean that, you know, there's not going to be some weird edge case or, you know, like a certain yeah. thing gets knocked out or, you know, I don't know. I mean, there's so many things that could go wrong. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. So yeah. I guess what else have you worked on that's that's kind of interesting to you? I, I like hearing about this stuff. It's a, yeah, so um, I'll kind of see how much we can kind of see if I can explain this in a way that doesn't, you know, that I'm free to talk about it. Um, yeah, I understand. So, yeah. That's what I was trying to do with the last one, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> so we, um, yeah, we recently working on a project that was actually, um, this was a pretty complicated one. So we're actually designing um, a system that would allow um, a flight system to crash on demand. Oh, cool. Yeah. So it was actually, it was sort of like, you know, a thing where, just in case this thing happened to go off course, you needed to be able to make sure that um, it doesn't get out of whatever, like the, you know, the valid test range it's labeled to, to um, operate in was. So you just so, self-destruct basically, but via yeah, anything. yeah. So you make, you set up with the trigger. So if it's, so if something goes wrong, you're able to guarantee that it's like, you know, coming out of the sky as soon as possible. <laughs> um, so that was pretty cool. But that, the hard part of that one too, is it's like the same, the same system that we were designing to fail was also part of the system which held it together when it was actually in operation. So we're like, I mean, okay, that we kind of makes sure. sense, right? Like if you want to guarantee yeah. it goes down, it almost has to be. So then you start, you know, dealing with like what kind of, um, what kind of guarantee, like what kind of factor do you need to have on the, the factor of safety for operation? But then, um, what sort of, um, you know, what's the probability of it not failing? as well. So those two things start like fighting against each other because you're trying to design it to make sure you got a factor of safety to survive and then a guarantee that, you know, it's effectively always going to fail whenever you want it to fail. <laughs> so once you start looking at like the loads between those two, like your operating window ends up getting like pretty thin where you can actually design around it. That's interesting. Yeah. It could was you a, use... It was a... Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to cut No, you. no, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, could you use something like an exploding bolt or, you know, like there was that um, not an option yeah i mean there was um there was like an explosive component to it um so part of it so part of what we're doing was also like trying to make sure we understood um how variable that explosive component was oh, i um, see so you know if you're let's say running you know 100 of these things like is there is there a chance that uh the actual um the impact load from the explosion isn't actually gonna be is it gonna be like you know, below a certain value, which doesn't fail it. And that was part of the thing too, is trying to figure out how do we characterize. And if you um, load too much explosive, explosive, your weight goes up and your flight characteristics go to track. And this one wasn't like, because it was a, uh, it's pretty localized. It wasn't too big of an issue for, for that one. Like in terms of like weight wise and stuff, it's more, it was, um, that you were buying this, this thing off of somebody. And if it, uh, and so whatever their like variability was, cause it wasn't the actual system we're using to um take this thing out of the sky wasn't actually designed for doing that it was sort of being like retrofitted for doing that so then you're dealing with okay what is what's the variability in that manufacturer's um components which are actually used for <laughs> the application right and now we're trying to you know using into this um this different use case and understanding that if you don't want it um you know if you need it to fail effectively like 100 percent of the time you know what happens if they don't load it with as, as much explosive or if it doesn't trigger, you know, to the same like energy and, and that kind of stuff. So yeah, it was interesting. So there's a whole, you know, test design, custom fixtures and setup of how to, how do we characterize this thing? Understand like what the variability is. That's fast. How do, how do, oh, sorry. Um, oh no, no. And then, and then taking that and like, how do we, you know, deal with the um, reliability considerations and then plus like the operating load um, factor safety. And hopefully it all works out that those two things don't just end up like, you know, overlapping each other. And there's no, you know, in some cases you're going to run into situations where there's no possible, you know, like system that's going to work because of the requirements. Yeah, makes sense. Around it. You're over constrained. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask how you validate something like that, but it sounds like you almost can't. I mean. Yeah. So you kind of, um, I mean, we we did a bunch of stats on everything just to to understand like what 
the number of tests we did, what's the variability, what kind of knockdown do we have to like assume um, on on the explosive load to be able to you know ensure that it's going to hit like certain probability levels. Um, yeah, and then after that, it's um, you know ground testing, flight testing, and kind of a lot of it's really in the you know doing enough tests to make sure that you've uh, got enough. So you probably um, run it through crazy maneuvers to try to get it to hold up in edge cases, and then once you've done that, you try to destroy it, and then you can validate that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, cool. that was an interesting one because that was a uh, you know one of the first times you've ever had to actually design something to fail in a certain way. <laughs> I mean, like some cases like you'll, you know, you'll design in weak points or something like that. So that if something's going to crash or break, it's going to, you know, break off something that's a little bit, uh, let's say cheaper to replace. It makes and, sense. Yeah. But this is a whole other, it's almost thing like where, a crumple zone in a car. Yeah. Yeah. And this was a, just got complicated because we were, um, you know, there wasn't just like, one little location that had to fail. We had to fail a bunch simultaneously. Um, otherwise, <laughs> weird stuff can happen and things don't, you know, deploy the way they're supposed to deploy. So it got a little bit, a little bit interesting at design set. That sounds very intricate, right? If you had to do like a bunch of failures simultaneously. Yeah. Also, I'm curious as to the weird stuff, but I know you can't get super specific on this, so I don't want to. Yeah, push yeah, it, it too was hard. A, yeah, I mean, it was like. Um, something that goes um like in like the supersonic range oh wow um, so it's yeah it, it itself has like a lot of energy and that's kind of why you don't want it to just go off and do its own thing yeah um, that kind of makes sense yeah so it could uh, just do a lot of damage if it hits something outside yeah. of that test range yeah exactly and really anything that's like i mean if, even if you're flying like you know little drones and stuff there's a lot of require, you know, restrictions around where you do that. So if you take something and fire off, you know, these sort of things, it's um, definitely got to make sure it's not going to go off track or hit somewhere it's not supposed to hit. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a that was an interesting one. That was kind of challenging, but but pretty fun. And yeah, it sounds like a fascinating project. I'm kind of jealous. That you got to work yeah, on it was kind of cool to see some of the actual um, like high speed video of like the the ground tests and stuff too just to see like when it actually they deploy the thing, how everything, you know, splits apart at uh, thousands of frames per second to make sure it's actually working and like off and going, um, you know, like symmetrically and consistently too. So it was pretty cool. It's really interesting. Was it, were you able to get it pretty consistent? Like the, the breakdown? Yeah, yeah, no, it was, it was pretty good. That so. seems challenging. How many tries did that take to get that right? Um, not, it took a lot of analysis. Right. Okay. So like, um, so that was part of it. It was like, we were, we were taking all this information and designing like a system that would fail, like in those conditions. Yeah. So like the analysis runs were, were quite a bit. And then it was kind of getting to make sure that we had enough, um, you know, enough understanding what was going on. And we were also, when we were doing testing and testing design, we we're also, um, trying to, we designed the whole system to make sure we could understand if there was like asymmetry in it. Right. So if you like fire this thing off, um, is it actually gonna, you know, pressurize things in a certain way, or is it gonna do some weird like twisting action? And, and does that change like between tests and that kind of stuff? So, in a way, we got kind of lucky in that uh, it was actually pretty symmetric about how stuff worked, and that made it easier. Because if otherwise, you know, things start interfering with each other and loads change, and it gets well, I would think for like like you said, twisting or just veering off course or. Yeah, crashing into a thing. I mean, that just seems like like the risk there. Um, symmetry seems challenging, but I guess if you design your failure points, because I would think about the variability in the explosive being, yep. like you said, like a big confounding variable there. But yeah, and that was one of the when we came up with the um, like the custom test to figure this stuff out of how to actually characterize it. That was one of the things too. Is like how do we how do we determine if it's actually um, you know if it's consistent if it's symmetric you know if you um load 10 of these things in different ones is there you know is there going to be like variation um even just 
Do you have to run you know, tests on the on the explosives themselves and like yeah, we did, speed yeah, we did like characterization on that whole system. So that was a big part of it was figuring out how to like what actually um, you know, when these things the the, the explosive thing like deploys like what is it, um, what does that look like from force? But also like a lot of you know is it is it um consistent like a, um between parts? But also is it uh. Yeah, is there anything going on that's like asymmetric or or anything that changes between them that where you see like you know certain ones react a certain way or other ones react like a different way and then that just kind of would add a whole pile of complexity to things because how do you you know how do you account for all that stuff and and be um sure it's gonna work without running like thousands of tests and that wasn't really like in the cards for this thing yeah that makes sense i would think the full system not but maybe just the explosive charge yeah you could run you know maybe hundreds of tests on I, I don't know if you got to that point but not on this one yeah kind of um we end up kind of um dealing with a little larger knockdowns so fewer tests larger knockdowns um, what's a knockdown and, in this context so it's like if um let's say let's say the explosive when you test it gives you um like a thousand pounds of force just as like a random number okay and then if you run um like 10 tests and you get a bit of like a standard deviation like between those of let's say like 100 um then because you've only run a certain number of tests then to get like a fail safe level um you kind of take the thousand uh pounds or yeah like thousand pounds of force and then you um knock down what what you think the worst case is going to be like based on it's kind of tied to like what the standard deviation is between tests and how many tests you've run so then okay. maybe if, if you think it's going to be like a thousand pounds of force is what we think will happen. But because we're going to run like a certain number of tests, we have to assume that worst case, you know, it'll be like 500 pounds or something like that. Oh, so take, okay. So like yeah, five you take standard value. deviations or whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's all like, you know, certain numbers of standard deviations, depending on like number of tests you ran and that kind of stuff. So with having to run fewer tests, then we had to do more of a knockdown. So then we had to design it to be able to fail at like a lower load. That makes sense. Uh, but then we also still have to meet like, you know, flight conditions. So if the factors, explosives are well designed and you do, or not well designed, but just consistent and you do yeah. like one test, you have to assume that test doesn't mean anything and yeah. you apply a crazy, you know, uh, yeah, I down know, to like, it. Um, with one test, you're pretty much just like, here's a number I can't do anything with. <laughs> who knows what happens if I run a second one? Unless you've got some sort of... Um, you know, unless like the manufacturer supplier has some kind of like database of a bunch of tests and then they can be like, yeah, we normally get, you know, here's like the spread of all our tests and here's one just sort of validate that it's within that. But really it's kind of like still kind of useless. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. But I, what I'm trying to get at is I think the more use, I'm, I'm not like an expert at stats, but I'm trying to understand. So the the less the number of tests, the more useless the tests are, the more you have to apply a you know multiple to your your standard deviation yeah the um the more you have to design the system to have a wider factor of safety yeah yeah okay. exactly that's that's interesting yeah yeah it makes it challenging when you know when you're limited on the number, number of tests you can run but and then if you ran like a thousand tests you know you could probably say with confidence hey it's only a hundred off like a thousand times like i'm pretty yeah. sure we can design it to have a narrower factor of safety we'll be okay yeah, for sure. That yeah, makes sense. Yeah. yeah. That's really interesting. I, um, I'm i kind of mad because I had like just the most boring stats teacher ever when I was an undergrad, and so I never really learned stats. But hearing you talk about it in this context, I'm like, stats is interesting. <laughs> like, yeah, it's like, I um, when I took a university, I had like no interest in it. Um, I only took, you know, one engineering stats course. But I then took I took a business stats course in university. That's all a lot of good. Yeah. But then, um, you know, I guess like a number of years ago, I took like a um, a course on how um, like the FAA um, comes up with like design allowables, like how that whole process works. And that was sort of that's all based off like stats and like number of tests and that kind of stuff. So that in that context, it's interesting because then it starts to be like useful because you have to apply it. So if you're designing like a new aircraft part or something like that, then you, you know, to actually um, develop your own like values that would be considered um, you know, to meet like certain standards, then like the number of tests like comes in and that kind of stuff, just so your numbers are actually meaningful and people actually buy off on it. 
Cause... That's that's awesome. That makes a lot of yeah. sense. Yeah. So there, there it's um. You know, a little bit of interesting use of stats that, that we that we do that I really had no interest in previously. So that makes sense to me. I mean, yeah, it's, uh, it's for me too, right? If if there's a real application, that's when things become interesting. Yeah. And if it's just academic, you know, then it's like I'm gonna go to sleep now. Yeah. So. Cool. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's interesting too to hear the interaction of where our work or the interplay of where our work has gone. Because, I mean, when, when you and I last talked, I was doing more, like, you know, medical biomed type stuff. And yeah, um, I, I recently got a job as director of advanced projects for a company that makes parts for the space industry. Oh, yeah. So, um, like rockets, nice. moon rovers, and satellites. Yeah, so it's, um, I don't know, every day I'm, like, probably holding the rocket engine part in my hand in some capacity. Yeah. Um, or, you know, doing some work on it. So that's, you know feel no, like we probably cool. have a decent amount in common these days with the stuff that we're working on. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of, um, like, smaller space companies and stuff with, like, small rockets that are using, you know, a lot of um, carbon fiber for, for some of their components. Like That's really well. cool. So, yeah. Yeah, we haven't been as involved in that, but we've we've talked to a bunch of companies in that area just to sort of see, like, um, you know, where they're at with their, their development, if they need support or anything like that. Yeah, it makes sense to me. Yeah, I think when I when I was an intern at SpaceX, uh, we were using like um, I want to say it was honeycomb aluminum on the rockets, and then they were okay. friction stir welded. Oh, I'm yeah. surprised we weren't using some kind of composite there. I mean, I think the fairings were composite, if I'm remembering correctly. Although I might yeah. be misremembering. I know there's some um, because I know that like I know the material that's um, like the the carbon fiber that SpaceX uses. Just because I, I bought it for like other stuff, oh, um, nice. but I'm not. Sure, I don't know what components they're using on. I just know from from talking. Well, to I, I think the it. the legs on the Falcon, like for landing, were made out of carbon fiber, if I remember correctly. Oh, okay. Yeah, I feel like the fuselage was honeycomb aluminum, um, and then I feel like the fer the fairing was carbon fiber, uh, just from stuff that they tell anyone that comes on the tour. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, but yeah, a whole lot of different materials going on there. Um, and, and I mean, I guess when it costs, you know, you know what is it like $10,000 per kilogram or something to send things up? Something, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, you're going to use yeah. the best materials you can find. Yeah. Because yeah, it's, it's not cheap to do. So. No, for sure. Yeah. 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 It's also, yeah, it's also interesting just seeing CNC parts for that industry because just the level of optimization there is um, yeah. it's sometimes surprisingly lower than you would think. But okay. oftentimes, I mean, you know, just like the pocketing is super, super intricate. And I mean, there's like no expense spared. So, I mean, the only place I've ever seen, you know, that triangular ribbing that you see uh, in the space industry is the space industry. Yeah, yeah. Because um, people will spend, you know, hundreds of hours of CNC time just to, make it perfect and you know weight reduced and you know the best strength to weight ratio they can get yeah they're like inconels and manels i mean you don't see in many other industries um i don't know yeah it's it's interesting to see that stuff um what was what was nuclear like to work in because i feel like that must have been similarly uh expensive to, it to was it was interesting so the kind of funny thing is like i was always so working at this nuclear plant um which was like mostly decommissioned. So it was super weird. Cause it was, you're basically, um, we were on like one little building and, <laughs> and, this, and this is sort of, um, this is like an hour and a half outside the city. So it's in the middle of no, pretty much like in the middle of the forest. Um, just so it's away from everybody. And it was, um, yeah, it was weird. Cause sometimes I'd have to go on like onto like the other side, which is considered like the active side where the radioactive stuff is. Oh, interesting. And, yeah. And it was weird because like, cause there's, almost nobody working there anymore so you're just walking by like empty rooms and like you know of well not actually not weren't empty they were like full of lab equipment and stuff that had been left over there but that was like a, that was kind of an interesting one to to get involved in so for we weren't actually like very involved in the actual nuclear side itself as other than just having to be you know on a nuclear facility at, um with equipment that was bought from the nuclear facility and i guess you know rather than moving it they just left it there and you know built an office around it that's interesting. So, was, was it, on the radioactive side, was the whole area irradiated? So you had to. No, but it was like um, when you went onto that side, you had to like go through 
um, radiation detectors and I had to take like courses on doing like self checks with like uh, Geiger counters and that kind of stuff. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it was like, so on our side, there wasn't much radioactive material, but there was, um, but when you went over the other side, there still wasn't a whole lot left over there, but still it's kind of like, you know, they're super cautious about everything, of course, just to... Well, I can't remember what it's called, but there's like a, a sensor you use to see what your level of exposure is yeah, at the time, right? Yeah, dosimeters, yeah. Dosimeters, so yeah. Yeah, so we're a dosimeter like every day, and then you just kind of like hand it into the front desk and hope they don't call you back and say that something's up. But, <laughs> it doesn't yeah. give you a reading? It's just like somebody reads it later? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. At least the ones we had, it was... Horrifying. I guess were, yeah, it was kind of... Um, I mean, we weren't like too worried because I wasn't really much in, you know... Unless somehow I ended up like, you know, someone was operating the accelerator with uh, the door open or something like that, then, <laughs> then something weird could happen. But that's not uh, seems improbable. Yeah, yeah, it was a. Uh, it's kind of funny at working out there, just because, you know, it's it was like a large facility and people just like ride bikes around and there's tons of wildlife kicking around. Wildlife. And, yeah, there's that area is just full of like deer and bears and stuff like that. Yeah, and like they would just sort of like. Out? Uh, outdoors, yeah. Okay, cool. So, makes more sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not like not uh, like in the you know. I thought you meant like. Well, I mean, I've seen like birds at Walmart and stuff. So I thought. Oh you meant, right, like, right. Yeah. Certain parts of the planet been. Yeah. Populated yeah. No, not so much there. This is more just they'd get over the fences and stuff sometimes. Though, so they'd be like walking around between the buildings or whatnot. But... <laughs> That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, we had bicycles at SpaceX. That was fun. Yeah. And then we had golf carts at Joy Global when I was there. So that was interesting. Nice. Um, I was recently in a manufacturing plant where they had um, tricycles. They had like two in the back, one in the front, like bicycles. And yeah. then, I don't know if you've seen Talladega Nights, but I, I took a picture of one of them where they had Ricky Bobby, if you're not first, you're last. Oh, yeah, yeah. Written nice. on the back of the tricycle. <laughs> That's pretty good. I thought it was funny. And so that was yeah. how I used up memory on my phone. <laughs> nice. Yeah. That's worth it, though. Yeah, for sure. I showed a whole bunch of friends. Yeah. <laughs> so. That's pretty funny. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, one of the um yeah, one of the first things actually that when I was working at the nuclear facility, um was uh and I think it's just because like you know, they needed someone to give this to. Um so like let's give it to like the, the new guy and he can deal with it. So it was this would have been like early two thousands where I guess there was a bunch of everybody's concerned about, you know, someone making like a dirty bomb. So taking like radioactive material and sticking it into you know, a conventional bomb make, and then you spread it. Yeah. Out. And then it just spreads radiation everywhere. Yeah. So one of the first things they had me do when I was like working up there, um, they were basically said, try and figure out if you could like steal the radioactive material, like from our building and how, <laughs> like how you would do that. And so then I kind of like, do they want you to actually steal it? And then like, no, 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 just to? no, just to be like, um, you know, just to, cause we had to make sure we had like a, legit security plan and stuff and there wasn't like a whole lot of you know holes in it and things like that so it was kind of like going around like interviewing like security people and figuring out like you asked them like hey like how often do you you know do you do things on like a regular schedule or do you like mix stuff up or like the you know ways that someone could actually like get in here and and we had such little material that was radioactive it, it wouldn't have really done anything anyway it was more just Anywhere that was considered a nuclear facility at the time I had to do this kind of exercise. Yeah, I mean, it was early 2000s. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, we had like a little, all of our stuff that was actually radioactive was actually mostly in just um, uh, sensors to pick up like other radioactive material. Um, just so it was really almost nothing. But that was kind of interesting, though. Just there, I think it was like, yeah, just try and figure out how you would break into this place. I'm like, oh, no, oh, I love stuff like I mean, when I was a kid, I would try to circumvent my parents' alarm system. Yeah, just by like go. sneaking around banisters and I would move really slowly and try to meet, beat the PIR sensors. And yeah, I mean, there was all sorts of things you could do. Um, they had these doors with the um, tamper switch that would come out. And so if you shoved a butter knife in there, you could defeat the tamper switch and just open the door and the alarm wouldn't acknowledge it. Or like nice. there were magnetic switches on the windows. So if you just stuck a magnet to one side of it, you could just open the window and you'd be fine. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it was, it's interesting to try to figure that stuff out. Yeah. I mean, I know it's a different level, right? Like doing that in a home system versus a nuclear power plant, but... Yeah, but... I'd imagine you know, the mentality is similar. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I have a friend that works uh, in the pump industry, 
and he talks about them doing black hat testing. So, you know, it's it's where they'll they'll just try to try to defeat something or like figure out how somebody would rip off their IP. Oh yeah, you know, just just different ways where you act like a malicious agent, and it just seems like a lot of fun to me. I always thought like maybe in another career I'd be like uh, industrial espionage, you know. Right. Yeah. I don't think that's the direction I'm ever gonna go. <laughs> <laughs> Not at this point, anyway. I mean, we'll see how hard yeah. for money I become. Nice. Yes. Yeah, you know, gotta have options. Yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, um, any any markets you're trying to get into that you haven't explored yet? Um, so we really, we went like pretty heavy into some of the defense industries. Um, awesome. And I'm mostly just because like when we we started up a couple of years ago, right when kind of COVID was hitting, so then commercial aerospace tanked, um, museum parts tanked. Yeah, it makes so, sense. And I mean, defense spending kind of always goes on. Oh, yeah, makes so sense. that's sort of <laughs> why we kind of kept focus on on that. Um, but also some of those projects just take a really long time to get into, right? Because it's like large defense companies, you have to like go through a bunch of steps to even just get involved with them. And then the right thing has to come up. So it we're... seems like a challenging industry to break into. Yeah, it is. So if you can get into like the right project with the right companies, like they can be, you know, pretty good sized projects. Um, and there's a lot of, there's like, we see a lot of potential applications still where, um, especially on some like the ground vehicles where um, there's not a lot of comps of materials being used right now. And we're like, you know, everybody's still concerned about like lightweighting, electrification, that kind of stuff in really That's every industry. Yeah, so um, we've seen like really little penetration for it, you know, so far. So we're, that's when we're kind of trying to keep a good eye on. Get How would you with... introduce composites into ground vehicles? Just out of curiosity. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of ways you can do it. So we've done other projects where we've taken a look at certain types of vehicles, like ambulances and that kind of stuff, and broken down the whole structure and said, okay, how do you, if you want to cut out weight, like what's, um, what's the easiest and like less risky, least risky way to do that, like for this kind of vehicle, rather than just there, sort of saying like, let's make the whole thing out of carbon fiber because nobody's ever going to go for that and it doesn't make any sense anyway. Yeah. Um, so then it's just kinda, for cost reasons or. Yeah, for cost reasons and even just things like, you know, maintenance and that kind of stuff. Like what happens if someone, you know, drives into like the side of it, you, <laughs> to, you know, is that like a replaceable panel? Do you You're have to like, shut the whole thing down for a little bit and repair it or, you know, so it's kind of like picking and choosing the right applications too. So we're not, you know, it, if we try to push it in like the wrong area, like that's not good for who we're working with, but then that's also, you know, especially in like, industries where it's not adopted as widely um that'll just turn people off of it you know potentially for years Makes so sense. you got to be like pretty careful too and you kind of got to understand you're not going to mess with their whole um supply chain and manufacturing process and you know come up with new production lines and that kind of stuff so you got to kind of like incrementally pick kind of like some of the easy wins things that are like you know simply replace that you've done in other industries and um and i've seen work and kind of go from there can you give me so, an example or yeah, I mean, things like um, like flooring systems are an easy one to do. Oh, cool. Um, a lot of times, so. Um, what are you replacing like, a lot of the time with that? Um, yeah, so some of those will just be like, um, you know, things like, like plywood systems, even some oh, wow. of them are um, things like, and then we'll just do um, things like fiberglass with like a foam core or something like that on it. So things that are fairly, you know, lightweight, you know, pretty strong. Um, you could still then, tap it you know, screw oh, yeah, yeah, which makes it similar yeah. to work with plywood. Or you can, um, in other cases, just like drop an insert through it or something like that. So Probably you've got better. like a, a place for like a bolt or, or that kind of stuff. So those are pretty, pretty easy. And then there's things like doors. Um, those are, you know, simple. Um, well, not, not simple, but they're, they're done in other industries and it's not, uh, you know, it's not a huge risk. Yeah. There's and if it like gets crashed into, you just replace the door, you know, and that's not the end of the world. Yeah. Yeah, and those are used in like, um, you know, pretty much like every bus company is using like composite doors too. So it's not a not a large stretch to go from something like that to like other kind of ground vehicles. That's interesting. So you just and you could probably even use that as a selling point. You know, if the yeah. buyer's hesitant, be like, "Look, buses have been doing this for years. I mean, this isn't that wild." Yeah, yeah, and even a lot of the, you know, the processes using for those like the production volumes and stuff are are reasonably high. Like not like. Um, 
automotive level, but if you're talking like ground vehicles for military applications, it's kind of, you know, falls in the sort of like the same ranges. So it's not uh, even a lot of the same design concepts and stuff you could kind of carry over. So that's kind of like what we try to do wherever we can. It's just sort of be like, yeah, we've done this in this industry. You've got this similar requirements. Can we do something like similar for you kind of thing? So don't, you know, don't reinvent the wheel every time you do it. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I'm trying to think what there's other industries where kind of, I mean, a lot of stuff in the um, autonomous vehicles is like a big one for sure. That's awesome. So like probably not as much like the little, like the smaller um, UAVs, like little drones and stuff. A lot of those are, um, they'll have carbon fiber parts on them, but it's just like a bunch of like pre, you know, prefabricated plates or tubes or something like that that someone just buys off the shelf. Yeah, I've together. noticed they're, that. They're good to go, yeah. So you're not going to, you know, you're not going to re-engineer that unless you've got a really good reason to. Makes sense. Um, but probably more things where you're looking at um, like larger cargo drones and that kind of stuff, like ones that are, aren't are carrying like a little like, you know, five pound package, but things where it's like larger distance, more like smaller aircraft, um, you know, that look more like regular aircraft. That's where like the weight savings make more sense because you need that for um, uh, to get the extra range. And so then, you know, that adds a lot of, like selling features to your products and it's worth doing the engineering and like taking a look at the um, the manufacturing process. So a lot of, a lot of those are built like um, almost in the way that like a hobbyist would do it in the garage, you know, like, cause you can do that fairly, you know, fairly easily with some pretty, you know, off the shelf materials, but if you want to actually, you know, optimize it, cut out weight, um, like more weight and increase like performance and also like scale up production too. Cause if you're doing, you know, it's easy to build like one or two of something, but if yeah, you for sure. get a big order and you got to build a thousand of them, like, can you do that using the same process? You know, maybe, but a lot of times not. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So that's I don't mean, think it's all challenging, but yeah, it's definitely 80, 20, right? Or it's, yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. So it's weight, it's ease of manufacturability. Um, and then basically that across industries. Yeah. And, um, like part consolidation, so reducing part counts, cutting like you know, reducing inventories, that kind of stuff. So wouldn't that come down to ease of manufacturability or am I? Yeah, no, I, I guess it pretty much would too. It's sort of like eliminating assembly as steps, um, which yeah, I, fair guess I didn't mean to cut that. you out because it's no, 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 to it's totally the, right though. Yeah. Detail. Yeah. yeah. But that's kind of like one of the other selling features or, you know, possible benefits is like you could take maybe a structure that's made out of like, you know, 15 parts or something like that and then do it into like a single shot. Nice. Right? So you don't have to like carry that kind of inventory. So um, the, but... the one time I worked with composites, it was a manual layup and, um, we did a boat haul. I think I've told you about this project. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, it was very thin plywood and then we laid up fiberglass over that. We put carbon fiber on the keels and then, um, that was no, sorry, Kevlar on the keels. And that, and okay. that was basically it for like abrasion resistance. Um, I feel like that wouldn't have been scalable. That was almost hobbyist garage level stuff that we were doing. It was a one-off. Yeah. Um, how would you do something like that? Like this was a catamaran. Um, like how would you make that at like the thousand quantity? Yeah. I mean, it gets kind of, it gets somewhat tricky in, in certain ways. Cause like a lot of times you're, you're going to be doing, um, like how big was this thing? Uh, it would have been 10 feet long. Because that okay. was, you didn't have to license it if you had it under 10 feet. Oh, okay. Got it. Yeah. I mean, so you'd probably swap out like the, the hand layup part, like, cause you were just kind of like manually like wetting plies and stuff. That was exactly hand. it. Yeah. 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 So you'd probably, um, one way be just kind of at that size, like swap it out to, um, just laying down a bunch of like dry fabric, like all together and then doing a, a like a resin they call it like resin infusion, but basically like injecting the resin um, oh, afterwards. Really cool. So putting everything under vacuum and then you just sort of like flow that through. And then you just um, don't even use the ply. Like you've just got a mold that you do this in. Yeah. So you, you could, you'd probably just like do a, you'd have a mold to kind of do that in pretty much. And then sort of, um, that would probably be the easiest way to do that. And then if you're doing, you know, that volume, you could just have like a, you know, like a wider mold with like a few of them in a row or something like that. Oh, that's cool. Right. So you lay them all in and then kind of inject them all and, you know, kind and then of you just them. cut the edges to, to separate them basically. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So this is kind of probably the, like the easiest way where you get up to, you know, doing a thousand a year would be not really too much of an issue with that. 
Nice. No, that's really yeah. cool. I'm guessing that would probably get the weight down too, because you wouldn't have the ply in there. Yeah, and well, you'd also like have, um, I mean, you're, you'd have like a little better like consistency too, like because you'd, you'd do that all under like a vacuum bag, um, so that would add like more uh, compression to it, and then you'd end up getting like a thinner structure and like less excess resin in it. Nice. So and kind of like more consistent too, because it's like a little less, uh, you know, if you're wetting out something by hand, that's just variable depending on like how you're doing it that day. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. There's a lot of sanding and wetting and wearing respirators and being there for days. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, and uh, definitely arduous, but fun. I mean, I, I really enjoyed it. I, uh, I would like to do more composites work, but never going to be as good as you. <laughs> I would hope not. <laughs> so, that's why it's just interesting to hear kind of the, uh, the you know, the 30,000 foot view of what that looks like. I really appreciate you kind of teaching me some of this stuff. Yeah, no, for sure. It's, um, and you know, some of the stuff we've done is just literally like companies coming to us and saying they need, we're building it pretty much by hand now. Um, we need to wrap our, our like production volume and we just can't do it like with this process. Right. So like, that's where, so then, I mean, there's always like, you're swapping up materials and stuff because switching processes. So there's a lot of stuff that you know, can go into that, but yeah, that's kind of um, one of the areas that we try to, you know, it's kind of a good fit for, for someone like us because then we've we've seen what the companies are, are doing who are, like, hitting different production volumes. So there's, like, the aircraft companies are doing certain stuff. The bus companies are doing, like, their own thing. But there's a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of things you can kind of take from all those different, you know, industries. You kind of understand what's, you know, what the requirements are for, for that kind of product and what sort of... Um, well, also kind of the limitations too. You don't just want to be like, you know, do what this other company is doing in a wholly different industry if they've got fully, you know, you know, different requirements or different like um, cost weight trade offs and that kind of stuff. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. That was one of the things I, I really enjoyed when I was doing more uh, consulting work was just being able to broker ideas, you know, like that. I mean, you, yeah. like you said, you didn't, you don't want to do it like stupidly. Like I've seen this over here. Maybe it's a good fit over here. But yeah. I mean, sometimes, you know, if you are appropriate with it, you can introduce some really good ideas to industries that otherwise wouldn't have seen them. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and that's kind of like part of what, um, for some of the, um, autonomous vehicle uh, companies we're, we've talked to, it's sort of, they, some of them taken of them an approach either kind of close to like how a hobbyist does stuff. And then some of them take an approach to almost how like a commercial, aerospace company does stuff and like interesting and then, it seems like either one could be inappropriate at the wrong yeah because like you're um you know the requirements around those things are not the same like you don't have to do the same thing you do on like a commercial aerospace structure like to build like a, a smaller uav they're just like simpler ways to do it yeah so for sure kinda, yeah that makes a lot of sense i mean i, I actually um I worked with a robotics company um, in the agriculture space that was doing, um, they were trying to hit, you know, like aerospace production um, QA standards and it just didn't yeah. make any sense. You know, it was like, like why are you doing this? <laughs> this is driving up your cost in a way that just isn't really necessary for what you're trying to accomplish. And so, yeah, no, yeah. for sure. Yeah, it's always interesting to see that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of like for, for us at least, it's sort of just like, you know, knowing right up front, like what someone's real requirements are, like for their parts. Cause then you'll sometimes you'll have um, ideas of certain things they want to do or, you know, a certain process or something like that. And then start to, um, talking to them and figure out, you know, it's, you guys really don't need to do that for like what, you know, what your part has to do. Like a lot of, um, you know, a lot of, structures are pretty simple in you know in essence it's like a lot of times there's a load somewhere and you got to get it from there to like another point um and a lot of the other things that people do it for um you know like real optimizations or or certain things i'd say probably on like the um you know very very you know optimized like super lightweight structures for a lot of applications it's like it's really just overkill like for yeah, what they sense. actually need to do. So, yeah, but it's, uh, yeah, no, it's kind of one of, one of the things we try to do like right up front always is just 
you know, get them someone to tell us like all their requirements and then all their sort of like things that are real firm requirements. And then they're actually like sort of nice to have requirements. Yeah, um, no, that makes a lot of sense. I, I had a commercial drone company contact me uh, as a consultant one time and they said, you know, we want a good, cheap drone, you know, that you know, is resistant to being crashed. I'm like, well, well, you know, what crash test standard do you want to follow? And they yeah. said, mil spec 810G. <laughs> and I'm just like, that doesn't make any, how, you want it to be cheap and follow yeah. mil spec? Like, I don't know for sure. Yeah, I don't think that's the right, maybe, maybe like, why did you pick that spec? Yeah. And, and what I was told was that someone on their team had worked with it at a previous job. Right. And so they just threw it out. I'm like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that sounds sounds about right for a lot of cases. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I, I mentioned that triangular pocketing structure that I'd only ever seen in, in the space industry. Yeah. I realized I've seen it one other place besides the space industry, and that was in a Frisbee launcher that somebody built when I was an undergrad in university. <laughs> nice. So you talk about inappropriate use of weight optimization. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Launching an eight gram frisbee with pocketed billet aluminum. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, gotta gotta have fun as a student, I suppose. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Cool. Um, so, is there anything else you want to touch on? I uh, feel like we're starting to hit like maybe a good natural stopping point here, but not trying to do it unnecessarily either. No. Yeah. Um... You know, right in the middle of doing a bit of a, you know, taking a look at like adding some more capabilities to our company cool. coming up in the next little bit. So can I put your website like, up at least? Or yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, we'd be. Yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely. You know, if you want to like, um, yeah, throw a website up, that'd be awesome. Awesome. I think we'll. Uh, yeah, happy yeah. to do it. And yeah, uh, for sure. I, I never say this, but I should start doing it. If you like this conversation, you want to hear more like it, please subscribe. Um, it's the best way to support the podcast and you'll get a new one of these every Sunday. So Steve, thanks for coming on. This was a pleasure. I really appreciate it. And, uh, hopefully I'll get to talk to you again soon. No, thanks, Spencer. Thank you. Fun. Check out ANS Composites if you're listening.